Hello, this is Dr. Ozer from Math Department. In this short video, I'm going to make you dive into my research field, which I have been working on since uh, I got my PhD from Iowa State University in 2011. Since then, I also held two postdoctoral positions, one at the University of Waterloo in Canada and the other one at the University of Nevada, Reno. And I had the privilege to work with the experts in in the field of control theory of partial differential equations. Before I hit the road, let me just quickly introduce you to current control theory research group members. I have Emma Moore working with me for the last two years. She's an LSAM scholar, and, and currently she's working on her capstone project together with her 498. She's doing mathematical analysis, uh, uh, one of the models uh, that we have been working in this project. And I have Kate and Joy, they're doing the uh, computational side of the project, so they're converting all the theory into algorithms and codes. In, in fact, I'm mostly interested in the Wolfram demonstration projects, which I'm going to show you a little bit at the end. Uh, and I have Olson working on the mathematical analysis of piezoelectric equations. And, and this is uh, his second year. And I have Ahmed. Uh, uh, he's a current uh, master's student and he's going to start working with me uh, in spring uh, 2021. And you could be the next member if you are interested in this research. So what are the basic math skills to start a research project with me? Well, first off, have a GPA uh, greater than uh, 3.0 out of 4. And getting done with one of those courses that I'm going to tell you right now is a big plus. And if you haven't taken some of those, that's still okay. So intro to proofs, intermediate analysis, numerical analysis, discrete math. Uh, ordinary differential equations at any level. So if you have taken the majority of those, you should be good to go. And knowledge of basic partial differential equations and or functional analysis is also a big plus. But again, if you haven't taken some of these courses, uh, you can still initiate uh, a research project with me. Here's the outline of my talk. I'm going to start with motivation and smart materials and applications. In fact, we have plenty of applications of smart materials in particular. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the piezoelectric and piezoelectromagnetic materials in general. So the first example is the very teeny tiny uh, flexible transistor made of piezoelectric materials. And the second example I have here is pressure sensor that has a lot of piezoelectric components and this one is a biodegradable one and we have a shoe design that they, they use uh, a piezoelectric layer in the sole together with its, with its battery so when you walk you essentially generate energy because piezoelectric materials uh, produce energy when you apply mechanical forces on it. And you also have uh, active mirrors. These are uh, future generation of space telescopes and you have active piezoelectric layers in the stack. And also we have the smart trail and at key locations there are uh, piezoelectric materials uh, embedded underneath. And when you just run on it and then the piezoelectric materials harvest that energy and you can use that energy to light the park. As you see that there's a lot of designs here and, and most of these designs use uh, partial differential equation models to describe the vibrations on them. But in practical applications, engineers use chips and that's a finite dimensional world. So you have to discretize the PDE to an ODE to work with or even a set of equations to work with. And at the end of the day, when you reduce PDEs, you will have a lot of problems coming along with that, then as mathematicians, we have to tackle with them. Next, I'm going to define linear PD models of elastic and smart beams, and this could vary from one layer to multi-layer beams. But before doing that, let me just uh, define a few variables here. So I'm going to use V for longitudinal displacement of the center line of the beam, and W for the overall bending, and psi for the rotation of the beam. And, and um, from now on, dots are going to represent time derivatives, and primes are going to represent the space derivatives. The first model that I'm going to introduce you today is the Rayleigh beam model. Essentially, we have two decoupled equations here. One is for the longitudinal displacement and the other one is for the bending type motions. And these are coming along with uh, boundary conditions of your choice. And here we have the length of the beam represented by L and H represents the thickness of the beam and all other constants are positive. 
and these are, I'm just going to call them material uh, constants. And this model retained the rotational inertia term here. That's why we have this term popping here. So if you get rid of that term, you're down to the so-called early Bernoulli beam model. As you see that you have a wave equation representing the longitudinal vibrations and early Bernoulli beam equation representing the bending of the beam. So these are decoupled because we're considering uh, linear uh, models for beam vibrations. The next model I'm interested in is the piezoelectric beam model that blends in mechanical and electromagnetic effects. So denoting P by the total accumulated charge on the electrodes of the beam. So we have one equation for longitudinal vibrations, another one for the total charge, and we have a bending equation. As you see, that bending is decoupled from the rest of uh, the equation. So these two, in fact, are coupled. Now I'm going to show you the models for smart multilayer beams. So when I say smart, that means we have a smart material uh, as one of the layers. All right, here is the first model, uh, which is due to Rao Nakra. So we have two equations representing uh, the longitudinal vibrations at the outer layers, and we have the uh, charge equation for the piezoelectric layer, and we also have the bending motion. As you see that all of these equations are coupled through each other through the shear deformation of the middle layer. Shear of the middle layer uh, sort of like couples all of these equations. So in the next model that I'm going to show you, we are going to sort of like eliminate the inertia terms for the longitudinal motions so that we are down to what we called like Mead Marcus typed smart uh, three layer beam uh, model. And as you see that we have one bending equation, one equation for the shear, and we also have uh, the, the equation for the charge and they're all coupled to each other. All right, next I'm gonna pick one of those models. In fact, that model is gonna be the Rayleigh beam model. And I'm gonna show you a very important control theoretic property of that model. It's called the exact observability. So here we go, we have the Rayleigh beam uh, equation and we, we choose the hinged boundary conditions to make our lives uh, easier. This uh, boundary uh, is controlled by uh, a controller U of T, so essentially we're controlling the moments at the tip of the beam. And we have all the material constants positive, so what I'm going to do next is to rewrite this term. Then we have this operator so that we can convert this differential equation into the first order form. And now we choose the states to be W and the time derivative of W so that we have this system operator as you see that we are supposed to invert this matrix. Now we're going to define the solutions in the higher order uh, energy space. We're going to define the inner product and, uh, and in fact, inner product induced norm. And then we have the following result. We prove that uh, if T is greater than twice of the length divided by the speed of wave propagation on the beam, then we prove observability, which essentially means that if you measure the third derivative at the tip of the beam uh, for enough amount of time, so the t must be greater than this number, then we have this observability inequality holding true. So, so essentially what this means is that the PDE model is exactly observable. Now I want to go back to the differential uh, equation model here. So this is a partial differential equation and this is an infinite dimensional model. And if you were an engineer and if you would like to design a controller or an observer, you would have to discretize this model so that you would reduce this infinite dimensional model to a finite dimensional model. So interestingly, if you apply the known approximation techniques, so many things failed substantially. And I'll show you uh, one of the results uh, uh, that they use uh, so many known techniques and those known techniques fail to mimic the observability properties of the PD. So in fact, this is the paper uh, by Banks and Wang, and please uh, uh, refer to that. And, and, and they were considering a simple one-dimensional wave equation describing vibrations on a string, which is clamped on the left end and, and free on the other end, but free end is controlled by this controller here, which is in fact measuring the tip velocity and then feeding it back to uh, the right end boundary condition to 
make all the solutions to be exponentially stable and it's proven it's it's a known fact that uh, these solutions are exponentially stable and then all the eigenvalues are sort of like shifted uh, to the left health plane. The first technique they practiced was the polynomial based Galarkin approach and if you increase uh, n from 3 to 9 you still have eigenvalues getting a little bit closer to the imaginary axis. I would assume that there is some kind of like a uniform uh, gap between the maximum of the real parts of the eigenvalues and the imaginary axis. The next numerical technique they practiced is the linear spline-based Galarkin approach. As you see that when n equals 10, there is no uniform gap between the imaginary axis and the maximum of the real parts of the eigenvalues. So they also tried the cubic spline-based Galarkin approach the situation is the same, failure is substantial. And in, in the fourth approach, they use the finite element, so-called finite element approach, which is pretty uh, uh, widely used uh, approximation technique. The situation is even worse. And, and remember, in the, in the PDE setting, we have a uniform gap between the eigenvalues, real part of the eigenvalues and the imaginary axis and that's why we get the exponential stability with the fixed uh, decay rate. And here is the finite difference approach which is another easy technique to apply. As you see that this situation here is even worse. So eigenvalues get extremely closer to the imaginary axis. And, and finally, let's see, we have the mixed finite element approach. I think this is the best of all the techniques they applied. In fact, they mentioned in the paper so that you have some kind of like a gap uh, happening here, right? Some kind of gap happening here. At the time of the publication of this paper, the authors, in fact, didn't realize what the problem is because these are known techniques and, and what was the problem? And the problem was simply because of the eigenvalues of the control-free problem in the PDE setting. Uh, those eigenvalues uh, have a uniform uh, gap, which is a well-known fact because you're talking about the wave equation. But when you look at the reduced models and their eigenvalues, you realize that the eigenvalues flatten out when you go to high frequency uh, eigenvalues. So that means for the high frequency eigenvalues, the uniform gap is lost. In fact, the gap uh, approaches zero as the mesh parameter goes to zero. So that was a problem. Now I would like to quickly talk about the uh, remedies proposed in the literature and the first one is called the uh, filtering technique and that has two different ways and in the direct filtering technique you just cut, cut off the high frequency eigenvalues starting from a threshold uh, number uh, that you pick and then you discard the high frequency ones and you continue with the leftover eigenvalues and eigenvectors and if you, wor if you want to work with higher frequency eigenvectors just because you're interested you can let the mesh parameter go to zero, you can have more eigenvalues in the list, and then you cut off from the higher number. So that's what the direct uh, Fourier filtering is about. And, and I'm gonna also talk about that and the results that I'm gonna use today. And in the indirect filtering, you essentially add a viscosity term to the PDE uh, with, uh, with a mesh parameter in front, and when you let the mesh parameter goes to zero, so essentially viscosity term helps uh, stabilize the solutions and in fact mimic uh, the solutions uh, of the PD problem and then as H goes to zero essentially that term disappears and you have a good convergence result happening. You also have mixed finite element which is pretty good in fact and, and there are some researchers worked on that. There's a two grid algorithm and there is also a paper just came out uh, that uses the finite difference method without filtering, without viscosity term or without Fourier filtering. And that's an interesting uh, paper. You can check that out. All right, here is the Wolframs demonstration project, which is already available at the uh, Wolframs uh, website. So this one is specifically for Rayleigh beam and Euler-Bernoulli beam. And for your reference, we have another one for uh, the wave equation and the uh, and the boundary damping with that. We also use the filtering technique for that. And this demonstration project is more about the design of the feedback controller by using the observation. So it's, it's very connected to what we have been doing so far. But we're using a different type of filtering. In fact, we added a viscous damping type filtering to the equation. Uh, to suppress the vibration. So just so you know, this is sort of like a representative example. And, and we also have a demonstration project where we have the direct filtering, but I think this one is already available, so I wanted to present this one.
So here we have the Rayleigh beam or early Bernoulli beam. You can just sort of like uh, pre-select that. And we have the filtering either zero or one. And we have N to be the number of nodes in the discretization. As you see that we have 20. We already have filtering one. So we're talking about the filter, filtered solutions in the next simulation. And we have the viscous damping and we have no that boundary damping for the time being. And we have the normal mode displacement. We got the 15th eigenfrequency mode as the starting point, as the initial condition, without the initial velocity. So let me just start the demonstration. With the viscous damping, we have a really fast decay. Now we are gonna choose another version of this. So we have the filtering, and this time we have the boundary damping. We have a pretty fast decay as well. And the next is that we remove the filtering. All right, we remove the filtering. We still have the boundary damping just for you to see the difference between filtering and non-filtering. So essentially the solutions are not really decaying to zero. Uh, 20, n equals 20, and I got the 20th uh, node, very last eigenfrequency mode as the initial condition. Let's see what's going on here. Uh, so as you see that we have the filtering on right now, and we have the exponential decay of the solutions, even for the high frequency, highest frequency solution. All right, here are some of the available uh, projects listed here. If you have your own project and if you want to discuss about it, um, please contact me and we can find an avenue uh, to, to initiate uh, joint research. And I have, the, I have two projects which are very connected here. Uh, numerical analysis of single or multi-layer smart beam equations discretized by various numerical techniques. There's a lot of open problems here. Another problem that I'm interested in is investigating optimal controller or sensor location on an elastic host structure. So this is particularly important for one-time design applications. And finally, energy harvesting is really hot. I'm, I'm trying to develop a novel energy harvesting strategy by using smart sensor controllers, uh, also controllers, uh, from the ambient vibration. So this is another available project. So please let me know uh, if you're interested and shoot me an email so that we can set up a Zoom meeting and we can dive into further in, this, in these research topics. All right, thanks for watching. Uh, this is all I have uh, and I am ready to pick up questions.